following program on Ava Verena 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. State of the Nation is an opinion-based program. The thoughts and opinions shared within this program are not intended to offend or disregard anyone's perspectives or beliefs. We aim to foster open dialogue, encourage critical thinking, and explore thought-provoking subjects. Recognizing the importance of diversity and inclusion, this program welcomes all viewpoints and cherishes the right to express them freely. This program also contains the opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Your discretion is strictly advised. The year that was. One year ago, a storm of protest rocked this nation as citizens demanded change. Today we reflect upon the events that unfolded leading to President Gotabaya Rajapaksa's forced exit from office. In this special presentation of State of the Nation, we dive deep into the heart of the matter. Why did this happen? And more importantly, did the protests bring change or chaos? Right now, Sri Lanka's independence in terms of its economy is at a conundrum. Since we are begging for money from the world, we have to abide by what the world says. The IMF is the prime example, whereas we have to amend laws and regulations to cater to get a $2.9 billion loan. Yes, it's a loan that needs once again to be paid back. Despite all that, right now the chaotic sentiments we witnessed last year have vanished. And now we are looking at the best way forward. For insights and analysis on this special presentation of State of the Nation, Tonight, I will speak to the Chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom, Rohan Fernando, Senior Journalist and former Director General of the Government Information Department, Mohan Samaranaika, and President's Council, Tirantawala Liyadda. This is a special presentation of State of the Nation. Now, reporting from Studio 24, here's Mahesh Jani. Good evening everyone, welcome to this special edition of the State of the Nation as we remember one year since the resignation of President Gotabia Rajapaksa. Today we dive deep into the events that led to his departure from office and explore the repercussions that followed. Well, in my opinion, it is important to acknowledge the significance of this day, not only for its impact on our nation's political landscape, but also for the consequences it had on our sovereignty and economic independence. However, it is also crucial to understand that the protests that led to President Gota Rajapaksa's resignation were not simply a spontaneous expression of public discontent. Now, we know with the information coming to light that, in fact, there were calculated efforts by several groups who anyway had their eye on disrupting this nation's course and used the real suffering of the people in order to further their agendas. These so-called protesters, driven by their own selfish motives, played a dangerous role in destabilizing our country. Their actions not only undermined the democratic process, but also put our nation's sovereignty at risk. Now we know that they were mere pawns in a bigger geopolitical game, manipulated by foreign forces who sought to influence our national policies in a manner that benefits them. However, it is also essential to hold President Gotabaya Rajapaksa accountable for his inaction during this critical period. While the protesters were busy stirring chaos and causing unrest, the president failed to take decisive action to address the issues that were plaguing our nation. He, in fact, chose to remain barricaded, surrounded by thousands of military and police personnel for his protection when the protesters were at his doorstep demanding action to alleviate suffering, a promise he made prior to coming to power. His lack of proactive measures allowed the situation to escalate, ultimately fleeing the country like a common criminal, 
spitting in the face of 6.9 million Sri Lankans who trusted him with their lives, completely dismantling the achievements of our heroic war heroes, the Sri Lankanism agenda, and more importantly, the Buddhist society. It is disappointing to witness a leader who, in fact, was the only individual thus far in this nation's history to win a presidential election, gaining the highest number of votes ever received by a single candidate who had the opportunity to steer our nation towards stability and prosperity, but instead chose to remain passive. Pro former President Gotabe Rajapaksa had the chance to implement reforms, not the wrong ones he implemented, also while addressing the concerns of the people and safeguarding our sovereignty. However, his failure to act promptly has cost us dearly. As we reflect upon this one year mark since his resignation, it is crucial to learn from the mistakes of the past. We must try for a more accountable and responsible leadership that prioritizes the interests of our nation above all else. Only by doing so can we regain our sovereignty and economic independence. So during the past year, many things occurred. The question we need to ask is whether those cascading events since July 9th, 2022, help this nation to be better off, or are we still deep in the precipice? Uh, joining me now to take a uh, look back at the events that has unfolded in the past year. He is done with Good to see you once again. Thank you for joining me today as well. Uh, well, what are the key lessons we can learn from this past year? Yes, Mahesh, actually a lot of lessons to learn from exactly what happened within last year. And as you have taken up this topic as well, some many events are going to impact us for multiple years to come. Let's have a look. July 9, 2022 is a date that most Sri Lankans would not forget in the near future. It was the culmination of months of so-called protests in Golface that resulted in the then-president Gotabi Rajapaksha resigning from office on the 14th of July, 2022. The important question is, where are we now? We must not forget the immediate aftermath of the events following July 9, where international media hounded the country's predicament, especially with the president being in a state of exile. A few key events followed the July 9 protests that have forever changed the course of Sri Lanka's economic and social trajectory. The first key event, which was also a first for Sri Lanka, was the appointment of interim president Ranil Wickremesinghe via parliament for the remainder of President Gotabi Rajapaksha's tenure, which would be up until November 2024. Two months after the appointment of President Ranil Wickremesinghe, the IMF announced a staff-level agreement to provide a 2.9 billion US dollar bailout package. This was followed by a variety of policy measures that catered towards the policy changes required by the IMF to unlock its bailout package. A key policy measure was the finalizing of the Inland Revenue Amendment Act No. 45 of 2022, which substantially lifted personal income taxes of the population, which was met with protests across the country by professionals. In the midst of this, the Anti-Terrorism Bill, the Broadcasting Regulations Commission Bill and a new Central Bank Act to make the Central Bank of Sri Lanka more independent has been brought forward. One key external impediment that the Western media kept highlighting was China's willingness to restructure its debt. In March of 2023, China's Exim Bank provided a guarantee of restructuring its debt. Following this announcement, on the 20th of March 2023, the IMF Executive Board approved the 2.9 billion US dollar bailout package. This was alongside a number of conditions that need to be met prior to receiving the second tranche of the IMF bailout. Across the months leading up to June this year, one key point of discussion was the domestic debt restructuring, which the government had emphasized would not be done. However, on the 30th of June, confirmation was received with regards to the domestic debt restructuring plan. Following the announcement, a five-day bank holiday was given to prevent panic in the markets. The domestic debt restructuring plan has come under heavy critique for the amendment of interest on bond repayments on superannuation funds such as the APF. That is a look at the key events that occurred within last year, Mahesh. As we said before, a lot of these things are going to impact us towards the years to come. So we'll have to look at how it's going to unravel itself. Over to you, Mahesh. Indeed. Uh, all right, Dani Dutanamas, I'm reporting there tonight. Let's take a short break. Now, upon our return, I will dive deep into the subject further tonight. Uh, my guests are entrepreneur and current chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom, Rohan Fernando, senior journalist Mohan Samranayaka, and President's Council, Tirantha Valaliyadha. All standing by. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.
Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now today we are changing our format a little bit. It's not going to be a lot of opinions or, or, or commentary by me. But uh, I wanted to uh, take a look back at what has happened to this country. We've been told by our leaders that apparently everything is hunky-dory. Everything is fine. Uh, the economy is doing very well. Uh, socially we are pretty okay. And in every part of our um, society, everything is moving forward as it should. Now, is that the case? Because we've been told these kinds of stories all throughout, but then later on we found out that was not the case. Now, in order to um, have a, since this is a special episode, I, I have uh, uh, several guests with me uh, tonight. Uh, I want to introduce you to Mr. Rohan Fernando. Uh, good to see you once again. Thank you very much for coming here, sir. Uh, Mr. Rohan Fernando is an entrepreneur, uh, founder of Hela Div Teas. He's, form, he's the former president uh, of the National Chamber of Exporters and Tea Exporters Association and also the current uh, chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom, uh, Mobitel. And also joining me is senior journalist and uh, former director general of the Government Information Department, uh, Mr. Mohan Samarnaika. Good to see you once again. Thank you very much sir, for being here. I appreciate it. And also uh, with me tonight is President's Council, Tiranta Valliad. Um, thank you for being here, sir. Um, I really appreciate uh, all of you all being, uh, coming here because the subject matter that we have to discuss is not an easy one. We have to tiptoe uh, uh, around this very uneasy subject. But the thing is, as journalists, we have to talk about it. As media, we have to talk about it and actually bring a viewpoint that the people are not being told at this moment. Let me start off with you, Mr. Rohan. Uh, now, 2022, let's take July 9th, like today. Uh, we know what happened. Uh, the entire presidential palace was stormed. People went in. Uh, what the, but the images that went around the world was, you know, jumping into the swimming pool, people are having a good time at the presidential palace, not understanding the fact that the presidential palace is maintained by their own tax uh, rupees, uh, that kind of uh, uh, event occurred. Since then, the country went through step-by-step uh, -step certain stages. The biggest issue here was the economy. Economic collapse in 2022 was the reason for all these issues. What is your take since the, uh, then to now? Is the business community, as a member of the business community, are you happy with the progress that is made? Do you think we are heading the right way? Thank you, Mahesh. I think the way I look at it, we can't just look at the present and the future without having a good understanding of the past. Okay. Now, we are a country that we embroiled in a civil war for 30 years. We manage the economy, right or wrong, with the pluses, minuses, there was a, the, the minus growers, still we manage. And we didn't have this kind of upheavals coming up. And then, if you look at how these things have happened in the world, I take you back to 2009, the Arab Spring hmm. that erupted in Egypt, where the social media played a major role in the regime change, which was captured by the, the mass media globally, which finally spread to Tunisia and other surrounding countries, and finally for the, to Libya, mm. which was at that time a very successful country, very prosperous country, a strong leader, though he was a dictator. And then finally he was eliminated, bodily eliminated. I think some of the, one of the, uh, they call it the eighth wonder of the world. Yeah. The man-made great river, which had cost I think $25 billion at that time, was virtually bound by uh, NATO and other forces. The Western forces. Western forces. And then today we know where Libya is. So this is something our country also should have taken into our you know, knowledge to see a thing like that should never happen in our country. And we know since the completion of the, the civil war in 2009, so many opportunities we had to resolve the ethnic crisis. Yeah. I think people got you know, elated by the war victories and didn't do the right things at the right time. And there was, it was like a, 
uh, a smoldering ember uh, waiting to uh, you know erupt at some point so what we saw in uh, last year july was a net result of some of these angers coming out onto the street uh, which was originally started at the economic hardship shortage of uh, uh, you know the fuel shortage of gas and the prices going up then it was hijacked by various forces exactly uh, with vested interests now if you look at 2020 and 2021 the entire world was engulfed with the covid pandemic and the the borders were shut this uh, the supply chain was totally disrupted i think uh, freight rates went to 10 times more than what it was normally globally the economy was suffering including the great nation what we call uh, america yeah and they started printing money i think today the biggest borrow in the world is also america the inflation is really high inflation is high the biggest borrow in the world is america of course from their system from the bonds i think they have about 7.6 trillion bonds of other countries on this oil petro dollar bonds they are borrowing i think of which uh, china has about 1.6 trillion in those bonds so though we are not aware or though we are not talking about it they are also big borrower so it was not only limited to sri lanka now similarly even bangladesh had same problems pakistan is still having problems so we i believe it was a, a similar situation not exactly identical to yeah. We, we, we know now uh, we, we we should have we should have known that this could happen to our country right and but i think i don't think our forces especially intelligence units were aware of what's happening or they didn't know what's happening that is a thing that or they knew puzzles me point. why a duly elected president by a vast majority in office for two and a half years or less than that and also amid all these problems was driven out virtually they were actually trying to assassinate him how did this happen and what for the reason we are still waiting for the answers exactly from the authorities as to what went wrong what happened how did it happen why it was not controlled or prevented i think uh, it is incumbent upon our former president also to come out he has not still he has not so addressed. far he has not said anything for him also to come out and say what he knows about it so leaving that aside our country was shut down for nearly 6 months when the country shut down for 6 months our meager uh, import revenues just dried up and the people who came during the covid to get free treatment in sri lanka by plane loads from all over the world and they were looked after by our country under the former president's leadership free medicine free accommodation free food they went back to where their countries were not looking after them where they were working <laughs> right. and then a uh, message was sent to them don't send money to sri lanka so these i feel the people who did this i think they were part of a for me it's part of a conspiracy why do you forget about the politics why do you want to attack your own country don't send money and then and then say shut the country why do you want to shut the country then say declare bankruptcy so this way i think it's important for us to understand this now how can we call our country is bankrupt i yeah. don't believe in that because now if you take a company a establishment institution where do we sign off in annual report where do we sign off not on the cash flow not on the pnl we have sign off on the balance sheet so have we taken into account the balance sheet of our I will, country I, i want to it uh, is very rich balance sheet we have i want to talk the uh, you know um, more on that uh, uh, let's uh, uh, move on to uh, uh, mr samarnaik uh, you were at one point uh, also part of the the whole communication point of view of the former president um, in terms of uh, the president's media unit uh, what we saw Uh, if you were an, 
analyze the whole thing. You are a journalist, um, uh, and as a journalist, you can see the whole social strata collapsing on, a, on, a, on that particular year. We saw behaviors which we would have never thought we would witness in this country. Uh, even we did not see that type of behavior during the whole uh, you know, 30 years of our conflict. Uh, prior to that, yes, there were a lot of issues, but then people start, it's, people never behaved the way they did. But here we saw completely a different narrative coming into play. What is your assessment right now in terms of what happened from then to now? Okay. <coughs> My assessment is that what happened on 9 July 2022 was the collapse of the Sri Lankan state for the first time since independence. That was a project. I call it regime change project number two. First regime change project was in 2015 when President Mahindra Rajapaksa. I would honestly call it the uh, regime change uh, Attempt number three, because I think in the 60s also did, they did the same thing. Um, yeah. With, I think, uh, uh, Prime Minister Sri Mahu Bandaranaika's time also, we heard, we saw some, uh, you know, interference from foreign forces cool. in order to get her yes. out of office. Yeah. That's true, Mahesh. Now, if we go back to the history since independence, in 1956, there was a change of government in this country. During that time, I can remember, uh, in the year 58, uh, 1958, the Newsweek US magazine carried an editorial to saying Sri Lanka will be the next country that will be going communist. Mm. It was the mantra th those yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. If you want to attack any country, country and the, take the country into your orbit, the accusation, allegation was that we are going communist. Uh, Will you allow me to add one, just one other example? In 1953, in the Latin American country, Guatemala, then President Jacobo Arbenz, it was a very poor country, even now, he wanted to launch an, a package of agrarian reforms. This was seen by the United States as a communist threat. What was the result? He was ousted yeah. in a CIA-backed so in 1958, the after just only one year after the Newsweek editorial, then Sri Lankan Prime Minister was assassinated. When Mrs. Bandaranaik came into power in 1960, uh, July, in two years' time there was a military coup. So uh, there have been s so many attempts, but uh, what I am saying is, in my assessment, in full scale, there was a regime change in 2015. Definitely. Yeah. 2015, one, to prove that point, uh, the financial statement of the Department of State, United States of America, 2015, then US uh, Secretary of State had a forward to that financial report, in which he clearly says, we have provided 585 million US dollars to restore democracy in three <laughs> countries. What are the three countries? Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Nigeria. There are other evidences as well, but let's stop at there. Then uh, what happened on 9 July is also, in my view, it's the uh, regime change project number two. The reason is that I believe there is no doubt, no dispute, there were enough reasons for people to get angry yes. that we don't need to repeat all these yeah. things. Yes, that anger was skillfully managed, manipulated to effect regime change number two. Uh, uh, we defeated LTTE in May 2009. Just six years, uh, six months after the defeat of LTTE, the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee compiled a report on Sri Lanka. Its title was Sri Lanka 
recharting US strategy after the war. It was a long report of about 84 A4 pages. There the report says, first re the report explains the importance of Sri Lanka in terms of its uh, yes, location. Then it says at one point, due to these reasons, the United States cannot afford to lose Sri Lanka. These very words are there in this report. Then it goes on to say, yes, we have to use additional tools to develop further relations and to adopt new approaches. This is what really happened in my assessment. That this is not to reject the fact that there were genuine reasons for people to come to uh, uh, states and even go to the uh, call phase three. Exactly. Uh, President's Council, uh, there was also a collapse of the law of eternity. We saw behaviors which we would have never thought we would witness in, in our lifetime because the law of eternity was so uh, uh, sanctimoniously sacred because they were basically looking after, you know, they, we had presidents who were misusing uh, the law and they stood up against that and they wanted to make sure that the constitution will be taken care of. And the behavior we saw from the law fraternity um, is that apparently statements were made saying that you can go ahead, break the law, it's okay, we will take care of you later on. That kind of a, a narrative which we, we couldn't believe, like people who were uh, following the law, who was basically hoping for a society based on, on, on a constitution that is, that is developing on a daily, daily basis. To see that, what is your assessment um, being part of that entire fraternity? No, 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 no. I'm not part of that fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, what's the issue? You see, what those lawyers did, did not reflect the position of the Bar Association at that time, even though the president was involved, right? I think that at one point of time, even members of the Bar rejected that and said, these are not our decisions, but the decisions of an executive committee and not the Bar Association, you know? Nobody really agreed with that type of activity because you, know, you can't be clapping and uh, garlanding these drug addicts and all these chaps who come out of the uh, out of this court just because they were in the Aragalia. So that was that I would say basically in diplomatic language a bit incorrect. <laughs> in undiplomatic language I can say something else. <laughs> I may have to bleep it here. <laughs> <laughs> delete that, right? <laughs> We are the other, what is the other question? We are not, I am not part of it, not only that, 99% of the lawyers were not part of that supportive But the, that, that's the situation. thing. Now, people like us, what we see on social media, what we hear from the news, the uh, voice cuts we see is being projecting that apparently that 99% is also with that 1%. Oh, yeah, what rubbish. 99% were against it. There were about 10 or 15 people who were jumping up and down there. That does not represent the legal fraternity. How, how can we restore the trust in uh, uh, the legal field? Because people think that apparently you have loopholes here and there within the constitution, you can break it and you can slowly fall back on those things. So what is your opinion on that? If the legal system was falling apart for a long time. Now it is falling apart at a much accelerated rate, you know, because uh, that matter is entirely up to my learned friend, Mr. Rani Vikram Singh, His Excellency, the President. If he, he can stop it, if he wants to do it, you know. You see, one thing I must tell you, there is this parliament, you find these chaps shouting, saying that Rani Vikram Singh came from the back door of parliament and all sorts of things, and that type of offensive statements, you know what I mean? I am not a Rani Lian, right? <laughs> I am not a Rani Lian, I am not a Ian any, right? But I will tell you this, Ranil Vikram Singh uh, did not come into parliament to the back door of parliament. He walked into parliament to the front door of the constitution. That is what these uh, chaps in parliament must understand before they made these allegations, you know. He, the con when the, when there is sudden vacancy in the presidency, the next president by operation of law is the prime minister. And that is how Ranil Vikram Singh became the president. No, he didn't come to the back door. He came to the constitution, the front door of the constitution. So that time I must explain to these people who are making these you know, unnecessary statements in parliament, right? So that is one matter. 
You see, where the law and order situation is concerned, I, yesterday I saw Vidyadha Rajapaksa, Honorable Minister of uh, Justice. He said something like this, you know. He said that there are 1,100,000, 11 lakhs of cases pending in the courts now. In the criminal field, one third are rape cases and child abuse cases. Child abuse cases, right? He said there are 4,312 child abuse cases and 5,550, sorry, 4,312 rape cases and 5,550 child abuse cases, right? So that is the situation now. But of course, that will be that that will be. Uh, uh, with all the pending cases which are a long time ago, which have, there have been certain delays now. You see, the, the main problem that we are having now, right, is the fault of the executive presidency and the executive. Because the executive is the branch which carries out the law, right. They are the people who carry, the, that is what you call the rule of law. The rule of law is the people who carry out the law. That is the depart, various departments, if you take the criminal side, right? Now Ranjit Kumar Singh is the head of the executive, right? Then you find the police departments, then you find the other also, all investigative departments, right, are part of the executive. So they carry out the law by making arrests and, you know, uh, getting shot and all sorts of things and, you know, they, they make their arrests and they bring the matter before court. Right? The business of the court is equality before the law. Equality before the law is quite different from the rule of law. Equality before the law is the business of court. That is, equality before the law means that the courts, when they decide on issue, they shall not give, uh, what do you call, uh, unnecessary advantage to one party and our necessary advantage another party. That is what he called, he called it before the law. It must be balanced, you know. No favoration of either side. Yeah, yeah. That is up to the, that is the business of court. But now, see the situation. And the police officers, you know. Now, there is a lot of stories about police corruption and all those things, you know. We leave that aside, right. The police people you now risk their lives, right, by getting, catching all the drug people. Now, drug addiction and drug trafficking is the biggest problem that is that is facing the country now, right? Now, now yes, day first I saw a new drug has come, the unknown to the whole world, it seems. Yeah, yeah, MC, yeah. MC4 or something or the other. So, I hope they will amend the law now to bring the uh, law in, on par with the drugs, because otherwise they can't even be demanded. <laughs> what I mean, <laughs> this particular law doesn't apply, right? So, now that is found in a multi-millionaire's house or something or the other to that effect, right? So now they have been caught you now. Now for all the drug raids that were done during the past 10 years, only one case came before the trial at Bar, no? you know, that is 376 kilograms of heroin. Uh, that ended up in an acquittal, right? That was due to various police, uh, contradictory police entries. Right? Remember one thing, right? Remember that the fact that a man is acquitted of a crime does not mean that he committed it, right? Sorry, that does not mean that he did not commit it. The fact that a man is acquitted of a crime doesn't mean that he didn't commit it. The fact that a man is convicted doesn't mean that he committed it. It's a, it's, a, it's a balance, you know. You can get out of, uh, through technicalities. You can get out, uh, you can be guilty, yet you be acquitted, right? Now, I think the way of the judgment in that uh, trial Abba case was that they believed that these people were guilty, but due to various technical situation, they were unable to do so, to give the do you, do you uh, see, what, how do you assess 2022 to 2023 with regard to your field where where do we stand are we are we in a position where we are you think there is promising uh, steps taken that would rectify the law or there is nothing in the law to rectify the law is very clear if you are if you are if you are caught trafficking drugs then you are convicted uh, and you are appeal is dismissed you are hanged that's all <laughs> so the law is extremely clear any person who is convicted then of what the, happens, sir? Huh? If it was that is why I said it is up to the president, Mr. Anil Vikramar Singh. It is up to Gota Bay Rajabhakti. It is up to Chandrika Kumar Singh, uh, uh, Excellency, at that time. Up to Maitri Bala Sirishtha, Excellency, at that time. Who saw that he is going to hang four people? Who saw? 
before uh, during the election campaign it said i am going yeah, to hang yeah, four yeah. people and he signed the death warrants and the supreme court of yeah, course yeah. bounced it on a different on a technical basis but nothing happened no the last hanging on 1976 right that is i think marusira okay after that there is something called the so called moratorium no the jure the law is there but the fact that it doesn't happen why so you see the problem no the problem with this no <laughs> As it is now, you all these human rights organizations, all these peripherals and uh, uh, Amnesty Internationals and all those organizations, right? I, they talk only about the rights of the convicted person or the prisoner or the suspect. They never talk about the rights of the children whose whose human rights are destroyed. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. you see now when a child of now as it is, we, we understand that even in the schools, children of 12 years are given this ice. You know, once you give ice to a child of 12, medically it will be shown that by the age of 14, that child is totally mentally and physically destroyed. What about that child's rights? Why are we all concerned about the suspect and his and his rights? If you, if you want frown at the suspect, you want to jump up and down. You know what I mean? You pinch him and he is oh, he has been pinched. Or you get a headache. Where is the Panadol? What about the sus? What about the children who are destroyed? You see, they don't think about that, no. Human rights, my friend, goes bo- works both ways. So oh. it's a two-way traffic. So I, we, we are not concerned about the person, the, the children's rights. And remember, the children, the 12, 13, 14 year old children, are the future generation of this country. You destroy them now, right? What are we left with? Exactly. And what a what a sad thing for the people, right? So that for what I say is this: the death sentence is there, right? The death sentence is there. It is up to the president or the successive presidents. So Mahathir Bala was doing election gimmick, right? <laughs> Saying that he would hang everybody, and nobody believed him, right? But the, the it is the president's bounden duty to look after the living, you know, to look after his, the community that is that he he rules over, or what you call he he governs, right? And then to stop the ice, to stop the drug trafficking. I know that people you know, we have seen their cases, right? You know. The, the drug traffickers, you see, they are mortally frightened of getting hanged. Yeah. Okay, they are mortally frightened of getting hanged, right? So, if once the if the man is convicted before I go to bar, the three judges, and it is automatically the Supreme Court will uh, it is taken up before the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court dismisses the appeal and confirms the acquit, the conviction and the sentence, then it is the bounden duty of the president, Mr. Vikram Singh, to take his pen, get the death warrant, and sign it, and say he will be hanged within two weeks. If he can't do that, he should not be the president of this country in these circumstances. He must give it to a man who has the strength and the courage to do that. You know what I mean? So if you can't do that, it is it is useless having all the discussions. If you you see, hang two people, I say I appear for them. That's a different matter. I appear for them. That is my business, right? That is my that is my that is that is a constitutional right that the accused stands and a constitutional duty that I have. But even if my man, if if I if a person that I appear for gets convicted and sentenced to death, right, and the Supreme Court dismisses the appeal, I will say hang him. You see, because I have a, it's a very impersonal relationship that I have. So if you can't. What I say, activate the death sentence within six months, or I will tell you this way: Mr. Vikram Singh can issue a gazette notification now, today, tomorrow, saying that all drug traffickers and contract underworld contract killers who are convicted from this day onwards, from this day onwards, and are sentenced to death and the appeal is dismissed, shall be hanged until they are dead. Within after that, if he can say that and if he can do that, I will tell you within six months this whole business will stop. It's just what you are trying to reflect uh, is the fact that apparently, uh, when you commit a crime, you're not afraid, knowing the fact that the punishment is not exactly something that you would, you know, you you are okay with it. But no, no, no. The punishment is not being executed. The 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 the, the, the traffickers who are committed are laughing because they do a better business yeah. than the rival. Because I think a couple of days back also, a Nigerian was. Uh, sentence uh, as well. Uh, there is a lot more to talk about uh, um, in our discussion in our special episode. But before that, let's take a short commercial break. I'm in conversation with uh, the chairman of SLT, Mr. Rohan Fernando, um, senior journalist Mohan Samranayake, and also President's Counsel Firanth Valalia. Let's take a short commercial break. You're watching State of the Nation. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone, to the State of the Nation. Uh, I'm in conversation uh, with uh, Mr. Rohan Fernando, Chairman of uh, Sri Lanka Telecom Mobitel, uh, Mr. Mohan Samaranaika, Senior Journalist and also President's Counsel, Thirantavalliyadda, with regard to what happened um, one year on. Uh, we saw the collapse of, just like what uh, Mr. Mohan Samaranaika said, the collapse of the Sri Lankan state was witnessed in 2022. And here we go, uh, one year down the line. Uh, Mr. Samaranaika, let me start off with you in this segment. Um, see, I can equate what happened in Sri Lanka with what happened in America on January 6th, uh, when President uh, Donald Trump and his supporters didn't accept the verdict that was given uh, at that particular time with regard to their presidential election. They stormed the Capitol. And there was such a big ha all around the world saying that apparently these people were uh, mobsters, they attacked the democratic, uh, uh, democratically held institutions. There was such a big um, conversation about the fact that how, how bad it was that their parliament was attacked, which is the Capitol Hill. Uh, so, but after that, this is what I want to talk about. After that, every single person from both sides, Republicans or Democrats, they said, yes, we need to have accountability process in this. We can't just be okay because next time also when there's a presidential election, you disagree, people will start screaming, shouting, and uh, behaving in a very undemocratic manner. That never happened here. We don't even see our politicians talking about or even going close to that word of accountability. But the, 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 the funny part is the people who were there at uh, the Aragalea who was protesting one of the key words they've been saying is accountability, accountability. We had to put the Rajapaksas in uh, jail, we had to get the money back. Uh, they came with a number. Nobody could even you know, basically pronounce that number because that was so big, uh, saying that that much of money is outside that has been stolen by the Rajapaksas. But there is nothing of that sort. What is your opinion on that? You said uh, in your commentary that never happened in this country. Yes, I believe, yes. Because there is a powerful section of the society we stand with the people who were at God's face. I will, uh, I will give you an example. On 31st March 2022, a violent mob advanced towards the private residence of the leader of the state, democratically elected leader of the state. This year, when we are celebrating the first anniversary of the collapse of the state, one of the leading English papers in, in our country had a, an editorial. Its heading was Mirihana Uprising Bitrate. For this editor, it was an uprising. How can you call an uprising? An uprising is something good, something justifiable. But people advancing, trying to gate crash the president's private residence, how can you call it an uprising? So there are other very powerful forces within in this country and outside. Who, who do Sri you Lanka. think? Sorry? Who do you think? Who do you think this powerful? Because you know, when we ta talk about these kinds of subjects, the first label that they uh, put on you is you're a conspiracy theorist because uh, you, you are trying to come up with these, you know, aliens have come to the world and all that kind of nonsense kind of stories. But there is truth to that because it is not just we are forgetting this geopolitical aspect of this entire uh, issue. We don't want to talk about it because we think that apparently this is, I mean, yes, pain was there. People were really angry. They didn't get their gas. They, the lights were not, you know, uh, available. Uh, and and uh, they were told that apparently I can't bring anything, uh, uh, you know, we can't bring fuel into the country because we don't have dollars. Then people ask, where, who, who, who spent the dollars? Who took these wrong decisions? So anger was there. But then, like you earlier said, masterfully, took it to where they wanted it to go. So who do you think is behind all this? The powerful countries. Now, Mahesh, we are living in a world which is dominated by a handful of extremely rich, powerful countries. Now there is a challenge that has emerged, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, to these 
traditional powerful countries. The challenge is that new power centers are coming up, especially led by China is number one. In 1990, China was perhaps the 10th largest economy in the world. Now it is, the, it is number two. According to US own uh, surveys and researchers, by 2040, China will take the United States as the economic power. So there is a fierce rivalry between these traditional powers and the emerging power centers. That is it manifested in the so-called theory free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the ultimate aim of that strategy is to contain China, rising power of China, then uh, Russia. If I, if I say something like this, China was becoming very powerful here in terms of business. They, the, the port city is the, the, the jewel of it. They were bringing, uh, you know, they were doing something new and if there was a successful port city, it would be, it, it gives the indication that we can replicate it here. Look, our projects are very successful. Uh, that was the reason. I mean, if you look at the place where the whole Aragalea started, it was right in front of the port city as well. And any, any, any pictures, if you Google right now about port city, you will see this is right in front of a place where people can gather and basically protest. It's not only it's the financial capital and every single big businesses are around that. So is that the reason you think? Yes, yes, exactly. There is an acute, fierce rivalry between these two powers especially the uh, United States uh, led uh, Western yeah. countries and the uh, Re People's Republic of China. So I, this is not to justify that China does the, everything that China does, but this is the reality. So now these powerful countries are getting ready to contain China, even to wage war against China using uh, Taiwan as yeah, its yeah. proxy. So in, in the year 2023, the US major foreign policy publication, its foreign policy, they carried a 12 series, to article of 12 uh, articles. The title was Lessons for the Next War. The first one is the, is the ongoing war in uh, b with Ukraine. between Ukraine and Russia, using Ukraine as the battleground. The next war will be with China, with China for which they, the powerful countries, including China, including India, they want to control this tiny, uh, tiny land. It was very clearly stated in their policy documents and think tank publications. The problem is most of our people don't read. That's the issue. Uh, Mr. Fernando, do you see uh, accountability per se in this country? Because apparently we are supposed to be okay with what happened last year and we are supposed to move on. Are you okay with that or what, what exactly do I think you think? We have never had accountability in this country. If we had an iota of accountability, transparency and responsibility, we won't be in this uh, mess. If you look at all the governments of the last several years, they are only making accusations, allegations, but none of these things have been proven in a court of law. I mean, I can't think of a single politician going to jail. So that means our politicians are absolutely clean. Or there's something wrong in the system. So the way they are making accusations, I saw one party bringing a, like a wheelbarrow of files. I don't know, the same files that will be brought up again at the next election. <laughs> But none of these have been taken to court. Now, if you go to London, the best places in London, like Knightsbridge, then Kensington, uh, St. John's Wood, a lot of Sri Lankans have very expensive apartments. So, Sri Lanka... They own them. They own them. They own them. And they go on vacation there. Some of these may be genuinely invested through businesses registered in those countries. I have no problem on that. But now I saw in parliament uh, some of the ministers saying that Sri Lanka has a gap of about 50 to 60 billion dollars that money should have come into Sri Lanka on account of exports and services rendered. So now if that is an amount 
that's a substantial amount. Right? If you get 10% of that, we won't. <laughs> we we yeah. can we can meet the immediate needs of our foreign debt. So why isn't any action taken? Why have we allowed our capital account to be so open in a crisis situation, knowing that we have a huge debt factor? <coughs> so look at India. India was in a in a severe crisis in 1967. They they were going through a famine. Ms. Indira Gandhi went to New York, UN, asked for food aid. I mean, this recorded. And the following day, Washington Post had a banner headline, India coming to US begging for food. When she saw that, she was so embarrassed. She told the delegate, let's get back. We'll never ever come begging for anything. And they decided, okay, we are going to starve one day of the week. And they did. And they are so proud of their country. And today, India is the fourth largest exporter of grains in the whole world. And we have to learn lesson from our, our, our neighbors. Sri Lanka can. We are an agricultural nation. We have been you know, dubbed as the granary of the East at some point yeah. in our history, which we are very proud of. But now, today, for our agriculture, we have to import fertilizer. We have to import chemicals. Then we have to import all sorts of sprays, pesticides, weedicides. Now, with such amount of chemicals going into the soil and the water system, we have to build now hospitals for yeah, non-communicable yeah. diseases. Kidney issues and all. Now, we never test what we eat. Do we test what we eat in Sri Lanka? What is grown in Sri Lanka is never tested. But what we import, we test. So if we test our produce, for which we have the facilities, we have ITI in Sri Lanka. I have been a director of ITI at one point. We are trying to set up testing laboratories in the agricultural district. None of these people will eat what we are producing here. There's so much of chemicals are pumped into our the food, food chain. So these are the things that we need to correct. And one other thing, uh, Mahesh, I just want to tell you, we have got some form of respite now without any people on the road and basic essentials, even at high price, we are getting it. Now we are borrowing money from IMF. Now next stage is how we are going to pay these monies that we are borrowing. We can only pay this money be paid by, by two things. One is we have to improve our foreign account by words of uh, exports of goods and services. And the other two, by expanding the tax net. I think the government yes. has taken this into heart. They are talking about it. I sincerely hope before too long, they will focus because our export of goods is, uh, it's, it's no point, it's a, it's a shameful $15 billion. Right, uh, now if you compare that with what Elon Musk paid for Twitter, was $44 billion. Right. We are looking at for the entire country. Whereas we have the capacity and cable to go to 30 billion. By, you know, restring the exports and economy, we are not going to benefit. We have to expand our economy. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, President's Council, uh, accountability directly falls into uh, uh, the law, law um, the, the upholding of the law in our, in our country. Uh, apparently, uh, should we hold the peaceful protesters accountable? Because apparently that's what we were told. And I also want to expand that question and ask you, what exactly is the role of uh, an ambassador? Because what we saw was not, you know, certain ambassadors were very much walking around, giving instructions to our president, uh, talking to our president as to how we should do this and that and all those kinds of things. And apparently for some reason, we just looked at it and we, 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 we were okay with it or we were told to be okay with it. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Accountability is a curious question in this country. Right? Now, I think you have to go a little beyond the local accountability now. I think all these people, all of you and you, are of the view that there is a global interest in this Aragale, which can be seen. I can see it. You see, now, let us consider it from this point of view, right? Forgetting about this goal phase. 
See who the beneficiaries are? Who are the beneficiaries of this Aragalia? Right? Now, Rani Vikram Singh became the president. Right? Now, by Rani Vikram Singh being the president, who are the secondary beneficiaries? Who are the secondary beneficiaries? Who? The TNA, the Tamil diaspora, and the and the further beneficiary, the LTTE. I'm not trying to be racial here, right? I hope you don't close down your channel, right? Okay, <laughs> okay. That is the secondary beneficiaries, right? Who is the global beneficiary? Hmm. The United States. Yes. Right. We 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 name it. Why is it? Why why is the U US so concerned about our little country? Like you said, it is a geopolitical thing, right? Now you take the globe and see if the if if America opens up a, opens up a military base in Sri Lanka, what happens? If you take the globe, the entire Middle East is covered. Yeah. On that side, right? The entire East, the South Southeast Asia, China, Malaysia, Taiwan, all that is covered with one Base. One uh, one uh, uh, carrier, not a, one aircraft carrier will cover that whole lot. That is why America is so concerned about this little country. I think in uh, our, our previous conversations, uh, in prior programs, as you mentioned, saying that you know uh, this is very much interested because they, they they really need to come here and put their 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 uh, feet on the ground because that helps their country. It uh, doesn't matter what happens to us. Precisely. Because then one, once that happens, you will find... Uh, now, Malaysia, I think North Korea has already said that they are going to give America the works one of these days, no? <laughs> 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 that, I, mean, I put it in my language, not yeah. diplomatic, right? They have said that they are going to you know, start. Then, you see, it is... There is a story, you know, the East is East, the West is West, and never the twain shall meet. Right? So, it is useless us going and, and citing America as a solid example of justice and uh, democracy, uh, democracy that is utter rubbish. You see, the business of America is to destabilize regions. No, they find a minority, they start financing, they start arming, and they, the, that country becomes destabilized. Right now, let us come back to the subject. The, sec the secondary beneficiaries were TNS, Mondiron, and and beyond that, the LTT, right? Why do I, why do, why am I saying that? You see, the diaspora also, the, the Tamil diaspora, yeah. Tamil diaspora, right? So finance, we are talking about finances, no? You think about it, think about diaspora. those things, think about those things, because as long as this uh, Gotabe was around, the Tamil diaspora or one Dhiran couldn't make any headway, because their business is to go for a separate state no, at the end of the day. They keep on talking about federal government. You want a federal government, right? Now, I think it even during Maithi Bala's time, Mr. Ranil Vikram Singh was always having a dialogue with the TNA about uh, distribution of or devolution of power under the, under the 30th Amendment. Right? Then Modi, Mr. Modi, uh, Prime Minister, right? he also came and started uh, talking about the 13th Amendment, right? Even the loans are submitted to the 13th Amendment, no. And now we find that. Uh, Mr. Vikram Singh uh, is negotiating with the with the TNA and the Tamil diaspora, or shall we say with the TNA, regarding devolution of police powers in those areas. You see, the moment you give police powers to that those areas, then the formation of a federal state is in the offing. And also, even in 2015, I think, during Mighty Ball and Anil Vikram Singh's conflict in times, there was a there was a move, right? By uh, to to by Mr. Vikram Singh to uh, to uh, abolish the PTA, the yeah. Prevention Terrorism Act. I think they are, they will do it again. They will not do it again, right? <laughs> the one they are bringing, the one they are bringing is a paradise for the for the terrorists. You know, the one they are trying to bring in is is, is paradise. You know, I will tell you why if you want. But there may be no time here. There was a move. To, there was a move to withdraw, to abolish the PTA, to release all LTT prisoners, right? Demobilize the military from the north and the east, and hand back all the all the lands that were uh, that were in that were in the hands of the army, right? Now it has started again. Now Mr. Vikram Singh is going to have 
reduce the army by half. You know, reduce the army by half by next year. If you reduce the army by half, who who is going to defend the, the yeah, defend exactly. the nation? Who is going to defend its borders? I, I don't know why it's, why are you doing this. It's These are all demands made by the LT, by, by the by the Tamil diaspora and uh, Sumandiran. Boy, uh, and I also saw from certain comments made by even in this very studio, certain uh, officials from the United States government, the e European Union was here and telling us, you know, uh, when you look at uh, how to manage your economy, uh, you have to look at the areas where you are spending too much and military seems to be one of those things, so you need to reduce that. And that was a, f that was a funny uh, comment, uh, which I found it funny because of the fact that when you look at their budgets, I think the military is the highest uh, that they spend on not education, healthcare, or anything. Uh, we are running out of time, but uh, I want to take a short commercial break, and when we come back, I will get the final comments from my, my, my panel. I'm in conversation with uh, Mr. Rohan uh, Fernando, uh, Chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom, Mr. Mohan Samaranayanka, the uh, uh, Senior Journalist and also President's Counsel, Firanta Walilia. You're watching State of the Nation. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to the State of the Nation. I'm in conversation with Mr. Rohan Fernando, Chairman of Sri Lanka Telecom, uh, Mr. Mohan Sambarnaika, Senior Journalist and also President's Counsel, Thiranthawali. We've been talking about what has happened to the, uh, really, about the state of our nation right now uh, and exactly the events that unfolded last year. Uh, gentlemen, my, uh, the, the time is running uh, out very quickly. We've been talking uh, a lot and it's really important because this kind of narrative is not being presented in the mainstream media and it is vital we give this kind of idea to our people as well so that they can make the choice for themselves. Uh, Mr. Fernando, uh, final comments uh, on, on, on the state of our nation right now. Uh, what do you think? Uh, where are we heading? Are you okay um, in terms of what is being done uh, by our politicians? Actually, we have got a, some sort of a respite from what we experienced last year. So I'm a, always a man who positively thinking. We have the resources, we have the capability to go forward. Now look at the, I'm from an exporter's perspective and an entrepreneurship. Our tea industry, I have always profit that we have to liberalize the tea industry, where our scope could be over $5 billion. Now we are struggling to take $1.2 billion because we are looking internally and not external uh, possibilities we have. Then you take the gem and jewel industry, I think that is basically a cash-based yeah. industry. So if you convert that into a proper industry with accountability and going through the banking system, I think you can you know, boost that industry. You talk about, talk about marine resources. We have so much of marine resources. Yeah, exactly. We are importing fish from Chile. So if you develop the fisheries industry, then there are agricultural export products, coconut, rubber. There's a lot of potential. So we have to focus going towards a $30 billion export economy, which I believe is not an impossible task, but not easy. If we focus on that and give the power to the SMEs and the big industrialists to do this, I think there is a way out and we can eventually there's, meet our debt. There's all because no debt. sooner we are in debt, the big countries will take control. Absolutely. No sooner we are out of debt, we can be like Singapore, nobody will come and come to mess around with us. Mr. Samaranayake, what is your take? What is the state of our nation? Are you happy with yes. it? Yes, yes. I, I use these two minutes to touch upon certain justifications put forward uh, in support of the 2022 mayhem. One is corruption and associated evils. And family rule, misrule, breakdown of rule of law, all that were there. In my view, those, were, those are only symptoms, not the disease. The disease is the economy wrong 
unsustainable economic model that we have adopted since independence. As Mr. Fernando very rightly said, we have enough resources to build our own economy and to devise a system that the results of the economic production is distributed reasonably, equitably. If we are able to do that, then we will not allow room for external forces to interfere. So that is my message short. Thank you. Uh, President's Council, what do you think? Uh, where, I mean, in terms of your field even, what is, what is the state that it is in right now and what is your uh, hope for this country? There is not much hope for this country. <laughs> <laughs> As it is running now, you see, the reason is that the people don't believe a word of what it means dished out from the earth now. They don't believe. Right? They just say what Trump is are they talking about. Right? So, I'll tell you what will happen, uh, Captain. I'll tell you what will happen. Like Oliver Cromwell said, people. I'm talking about people around these political chaps who are jumping around the roads, yeah. right? There is a saying, you know, when people run out of words, they will reach for their swords. That is what is going to happen. And when I say people, I don't mean these people who are, you know, living in the laps of luxury and making vast statements about human rights and fundamental rights and fundamental freedoms and rah, 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 rah. I'm talking about the man who, who feels or who knows the warmth of the sun, the heat of the earth, and the sweetness of the waters that flow along our rivers. Right? One day, very soon, I will tell you, if this system doesn't change, if Mr. Vikramasinghe does not take adequate action immediately to, res to resolve the legal, si the legal problems here and to stop the criminal, uh, criminal situation and the economic situation immediately, the people will rise up with such a cry of vengeance that this country has never known. You think in the worst is yet to come? It is yet to come, but it will come soon. I want to thank uh, Mr. Rohan Fernandez, Chairman of uh, Sri Lanka Telecom, Mr. Mohan Samaraka, Senior Journalist, and also President's Council, Thiranthu Aliyad, for taking the time to come and uh, speak to us, uh, educate our uh, public, and also give a different perspective rather than this mainstream narrative which has been always said uh, in this country. Well, as we all know, our country is going through some challenge, challenging times. The economic crisis has hit us hard, and there's uncertainty in the air. But you know what? I strongly believe that difficult times bring out the best in us. Our society is built on unity, compassion and resilience and fed by the teachings of Lord Buddha and many other religious leaders that nourishes our soul. So it's crucial that amidst this adverse situation, we don't allow ourselves to fall into the hands of foreign forces who might exploit our vulnerabilities for their own interest. We need to rally together and remember that our true strength lies in our unity. I know it might seem tough and, and the road ahead might be challenging, but trust me, we can turn this crisis into an opportunity for growth and change. It starts very simply, like what our panel said, with each and every one of us embracing the power within ourselves to make a difference. How can we make a positive impact? Well, the question and the answer is very simple. It can be as simple as supporting local businesses, buying locally produced goods and investing in our communities. By doing this, we can boost our economy from within and reduce our dependency on external sources. Remember, we have faced difficult times in the past and emerged stronger than ever before. This is just another chapter in our story, and I have no doubt that we will come out of it shining bright. Together, we can overcome any obstacle that comes our way. So let's stand tall together, shoulder to shoulder, pro as proud Sri Lankans. Let's lend a helping hand to our brothers and sisters who are struggling. Let's show the world the unwavering spirit that runs through our veins, which we call being a Sri Lankan. From the deepest corners of my heart, I urge you all to stay motivated, stay positive, and stay united. Together, we can create a brighter, prosperous future for Sri Lanka, for us and for our children. On a programming note, make sure you check out 
State of the Nation podcast out every week. The State of the Nation podcast is available on Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. Also, do get in touch with us as uh, we would like to hear your views, feedback, and suggestions. You can write to us about anything you saw on the program. You agree, disagree? Please send us your comments to State of the Nation at Derana.org. I'm Mahesh Johnny from all of us at Adhidharana 24. Have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you on Tuesday on Get Ready.